Hey everybody, I'm really glad you found Suncrest Messages. I do hope you'll take a minute to subscribe to either our podcast or our YouTube channel. And you can also download the Suncrest app. There's great stuff there that goes far beyond these messages. Either way, I hope that the next 30 minutes helps you integrate faith with your life. Enjoy. So last weekend, after I drew this triangle up here on the board and had lots of great conversations in the commons area, someone came up to me and they said to me, Greg, this is portable. And what they were saying to me is, hey, not only can I remember these concepts, but with the shapes that you're giving us, I can pass them on to someone else. And the reason that struck me so powerfully is because we almost titled the series, It's Portable, right? And this is the idea. We're taking some things that can be fairly complex and difficult to understand, but there's a simple way to see them, so simple that not only can you understand them, but you can pass them on. And last week, I introduced the idea of mnemonic devices. That's essentially what these shapes are. I shared a few of them with you. And then I prompted a few in my weekly email and on Facebook this week, and I was just flooded with all of your mnemonic devices. And I gotta tell you, it's so fascinating to me, all the things that are out there. A lot of them were industry specific, right? So maybe you're a math teacher. Apparently you have lots of math teachers and there's lots of math mnemonic devices. Maybe you're a first aid person or a musician. There's lots of musicians, you know, lots of things to remember. Um, Maybe you're an English teacher, and I think English teachers have the most difficulty with mnemonic devices because it's English, right? Like, you know this device, right? I before E, except after C. Have you seen this mug? I before E, except after C. And also when you heinously seize your feisty foreign neighbor's conceited beige heifer from the ceiling. Weird. Yeah, it doesn't always work, does it? That's kind of the, that's kind of the idea. And um, I got some that I thought, yeah, that's not gonna help me in the situation that I'm in. So, so this is from a friend of ours who moved here from Florida. Red on black, friend of Jack, red on yellow, will kill a fellow. Now, you know that's about snakes, right? So like if you encounter a snake, you can think of this thing, and then you're like, okay, can I pet it or not? Like, what are you trying to decide <laughs> when you have a snake in front of you? And here's the thing. This is a doomed mnemonic device because the part that rhymes doesn't help you at all. If I was standing in front of a snake and I was nervous, I'm pretty sure I'd be like, red on black will kill Jack. <laughs> red and yellow, it's a fine fellow. I don't, I don't know, like it's, it's just not gonna work for me. But then, like, a lot of you have trouble apparently remembering north, east, south, and west. And you have all these different things to help you remember this. Fo- follow this. It was never eat sour watermelon, then never eat shredded wheat, then never eat soggy waffles, then never eat soggy Wheaties, and never eat soggy worms. How about that? I, I think, how about we just remember northeast, south, and west? Halt. So this one we've shared before, and this is a great tool You should halt, you should pause, not make any big decisions when you're hungry, when you're angry, when you're lonely, or when you're tired. You should not have a big reaction. You should not react emotionally when you're hungry, or you're angry, or you're lonely, or you're tired. That's my gift to you today. You're going to love that one, okay? Apparently, we live close enough to Lake Michigan that everybody had to memorize the Great Lakes, and you used homes for this device, you, you got that one figured out, right? Now I'm gonna give you my three favorites and then we're gonna get into the message. So someone gave me this one, forks. Do you know this one? You ever tried to remember how are you supposed to set the table? Like where's the fork, where's the knife go, where's the spoon, all that? This will help you. And this is like another gift to you, follow this. Start on the left, fork, it's the F, goes on the left. The O of forks is the plate. And then you go to the right and then you have the K, the knife, and then the spoon. And now you'll never forget how to set the table again, all right? Now, here's my favorite sarcastic one. We have a lot of first responders at our church. This guy's a firefighter in Crown Point. Todd was uh, baptized here last year, just a really fun guy. And he said, (laughs) stroke symptoms, fast. Facebook announcement with your suspicion. Ask for thoughts and prayers. Search Google for your symptoms and then try essential oils. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. And then when I put this on Facebook, I I don't know why I didn't expect this, but my mom replied to Facebook. And here's what she said. I can't tell you or you would know my passwords. Which probably says a few things about my relationship with my mom. I'm not sure what, what all that says. But we've been doing these mnemonic devices because these tools that we have, this visual vocabulary, will help us recall the right things at the right times. This is actually why I'm fascinated that, hey, math teachers remember math things, musicians remember music things, and so on, because... If you're not a follower of Christ, if you don't believe in God, what I'm sharing with you 
No need to recall it. It's useless. But if you are, when you're in certain situations, these things will come to mind, and then you'll write, oh yeah, that's right. And so in week one, we talked about how you can actually have a real experience with God. If you sense he's prompting you or in your situation and you think, was, was that God? Or you're reading the scriptures and something hits you, we gave you a circle. You can process that. You'll have to go back and watch the video if you want that one. Last week, I gave you what I think is the biggest misunderstanding in Christianity. And if you just get obedience in the right direction in this triangle, it will set you free in life. Next week, there's going to be a shape. That, this, is, this is powerful. The shape next week is going to address what I think is, for Americans, probably Jesus' command that we ignore and disobey the most. It's not seen as heinous in most circles. You wouldn't think of it as heinous. And yet its effect on our life because we don't follow it is massive. So that'll be next week. And this week, I want to address frustrations that we have in our life. The shape that I'm going to give you this week is the most common shape I use in conversations after a service out in the commons area. Because all the time I'll talk with people, maybe you're like this, who are frustrated in a relationship that they have. And they'll think to themselves, they'll say things like, why doesn't this person just do this? Or how am I supposed to handle this situation with him or with her? And this shape will help you sort some of that out. But it's not just in relationships. Sometimes it's our frustrations with ourselves. If you find yourself to be overwhelmed, this shape will help you. Or on the entire flip side, if you find yourself like, life is boring, honestly. It's kind of mundane. It's the same today and then tomorrow and then the next day. This shape can help you. I think sometimes people don't quite know how to relate to God in real life, and probably because they've been fed two extremes and you think you have to choose one or the other. Some of you think the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, is in the Bible. It's not. And if you think that way, you pretty much think, yeah, there's a God, but it's kind of up to me. Others of you live by the phrase, let go and let God, which is also not in the Bible and should have at least a little nuance to it if you're going to try to integrate it in your life because there's a sense in which it's all God and none me in that situation. And so today, I want you to draw with me this shape. So you can do it on your outline as you're following. If you're doing the digital outline, there's cards in the seat back pockets and pens there. So you can go with with the analog version there. And what I'm going to draw for you today is a tripod, okay? Now, I mean, it's pretty simple to draw a tripod, right? So, So do this with me. Uh, Oh, that's probably too wide. Oh, well, doesn't matter. That's not the important part. This tripod has, of course, three legs. And if you feel like an artist, I mean, go ahead, put a camera on top of the tripod. Doesn't really matter that much, but yeah, why not? What is that, a flash cube on top of that camera? Who uses flash cubes anymore? (laughs) Most of you don't even know what a flash cube is, right? Anyway, anyway, the idea behind a tripod, of course, is that it has three legs. And all three legs are really, really important. Now, I'm going to label these three legs for you. You can label these yourself. But the key is how these three legs interact with one another. So in almost any situation that you face, you can ask this question. You can say, what is my part? My part. And I bet in almost any situation that you have, even when the overwhelming feeling might be let go and let God, you'll be able to come up with something that's actually yours, actually yours to do. Some of you are control freaks. And you try to over-engineer every situation that you're in, and the only thing you think about is your part. There's a second part in every situation, that is God's part. And I don't know if you're more prone to dump everything on God or not let him have anything at all, but the way that you relate to God in all of the situations in life will will have an effect. And then when it comes to our relationships, we always have to remember there is their part. Their part. So if you're having issues with your mom or your son or your uncle or your boss, and you're trying to sort out how should I approach this, 
It's a really healthy thing to step back and say, well, what's my part? What's God's part? And what's their part? Now, I actually brought a real-life tripod with me tonight. And I only put this up here to remind you that it's not so important to learn individual things about individual legs. The tripod works great when all three legs are in a proper position. What happens, though, is we sometimes leave one out, and your life looks a lot like this. Sometimes you leave two out, and you think, can we balance this on one? No, you can't. But that's the whole design behind the tripod. And so I want you to think for a little bit today about all your situations in life and how God weaves these three pieces with one another. I'm going to start by reading a passage of Scripture to you that you'll see starts to illustrate how all of these different things fit together. This is a beautiful passage from the letter the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Galatia called Galatians. Here's what it says. If someone is caught in a sin, let's just stop there. If you know someone and they're caught in a sin, Do you have a role in that? I mean, it's someone else's. It's theirs. You're a brother or sister in Christ, part of the family. Do you have a part in that? The scriptures say, if someone's caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Now, most of you right now can think of someone in your life who's also a follower of Jesus, but there's a part of their life that isn't honoring to God. And the scriptures are starting to suggest you shouldn't just let that person go, and you also shouldn't come and hammer them. But you absolutely should go to them, speak to them about it, and restore them gently. I don't know if you ever thought, like, oh, this all fits together. And then it says, but watch yourselves. But watch yourselves. You could get self-righteous if you go around correcting other people. I mean, it's Jesus who would talk about things like this and he'd say, hey, why is it that you try to take the speck of dust out of your brother's eye when you have a plank in your own eye? First take the plank out of your own eye, then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck of dust. This concept that I need to pay attention to my life, I do need to pay attention to other people's lives, and I need to pay attention to what God is doing, this all fits together. That passage in Galatians goes on. It says, Carry each other's burdens. Now, this word burdens, this is very important. The word burdens here has the image of being a boulder. It's a boulder that no one person could carry on their own. And when you come across someone else, and they're carrying a boulder in life, something that no reasonable person would think they can carry it on their own. The question is, do I have a part in their life? And the scriptures say, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks they are something when they are not, they deceive themselves. It's good to think about yourself and think yourself with sober judgment. What's my part? I shouldn't think I'm more than I am. Each one should test their own actions. And then get this, each one should carry their own load. Now, the contrast in this passage is between burdens, which is like a boulder that no one could carry on their own, and this image that everyone should carry their own load. The load image is probably just like a backpack. And one of the things the scriptures are teaching you, this this will get you through your next tough relationship, is that when someone has a boulder in their life, you should help them carry it. When someone has a backpack in their life, you should not help them carry it. You should not do for someone else what they can do on their own. And in your own life, if you have a boulder, it is perfectly okay to say, I need some help over here. But everyone has their own stuff, stuff that you should be able to carry yourself. That's your backpack. And if you start dumping your backpack, things that are reasonably yours to carry on others, it's not cool. 
And you'll start to be able to sort out in some of your relationships, I'm sure, man, where am I getting this right? Where am I getting it wrong? And then it says, and do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. He set up this world in a way where people reap what they sow. People experience the consequences of their actions. And many times the godly thing to do is to allow someone to experience the consequences of their actions. That's actually the way the world is designed. Jesus would come back to this over and over again. He'd say things like, Forgive one another. If you don't forgive one another, your heavenly Father will not forgive you. You get these three legs right, you get them all moving in the right direction all the time, you calibrate them in the right way, life can be good. But if if you don't think they interact with each other, if you think you can run anyone solo, it's crazy. The story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus told, have you ever thought about this? There was a man who went on a journey and he saw, and saw a man hurting on the side of the road. First couple of guys walk by, this is the problem. The guy who was laying dead on the, almost dead on the side of the road, that's a boulder situation. That's a burden he couldn't solve himself. And the scriptures say, when you come in contact with someone like that, you're the follower of Jesus, you help them. And this guy did. He reached out and he helped them. When they couldn't do their part, he said, I'll take that on as my part. And he took him to an inn and he got him some care and he gave the innkeeper some money. And then this is kind of the wild part. He didn't stay at the inn. He went on on his journey. When he felt like, all right, that guy, he should be able to take care of it on his own now. He didn't overfunction in the situation. Think about this scripture from Hebrews. Scriptures say, but my righteous one will live by faith. And this is an interesting question, maybe for all of you. This only makes sense to you if you're a follower of Jesus, if you believe in Christ. Do you live by faith? Now, a lot of people would say, I have faith, but that's not what this is talking about. This is saying, do I live by faith? And sometimes people think living by faith, I don't know what that means. That means taking risks, living blindly. Like, Greg, you should just put your leg out over the edge, and even though there's nothing there to hold you, you should just go for it. That's not living by faith. Living by faith is when you are prompted that God wants you to take a step and you're scared. There's a part of you that doesn't want to do it, and you think it might not work out, but you know God wants you to. You're actually just living into, you're living by faith that since God wants you to do that, He will be there with you because He's led you there. There's a fascinating passage when Jesus comes upon a man who had been sick for a long time. Follow this with me. It says, when Jesus saw him lying there, and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? See, I'm confident in a room like this, there's plenty of you right now who are over-functioning in a relationship. And there's someone who's not carrying their own weight And the truth is, it's not a boulder. It's just their backpack. And you wish they would take responsibility. You wish they would get things together. You wish. But part of your wishing leads you to do things for them. And one of the things that we learn from Jesus himself is that, yeah, you have a part, but they have a part. I mean, I won't make you show your hands, but how many of you have ever given in to someone's whining or their guilt trip to get you to do something that you didn't even want to do, but you did it anyway? Possibly that's because you've misunderstood my part and their part. How many of you, with your son or with your brother or with your uncle, have bailed them out time and time and time and time again, and you're thinking about doing it again. 
And they aren't doing anything for themselves. But you're just going to pour yourself out there and you're going to carry their backpack, not their boulder. Jesus looks at situations like that and says, hey, do you want to get well? I need to see something from you. You need to do your part. And if you do your part, then I'll do my part. I don't know if that seems harsh to you. I don't know if you're like, I can't believe my pastor's saying this right now. But it's just the way that God designed the world. Of course, it's also possible that in your life right now, you know somebody who needs your help. They have a boulder. They can't carry it themselves. And you've actually kind of decided, nah, that'd mess up my life. I don't want to get tangled up in that. You're too busy to be a bit distracted by helping people. And you're kind of tapping out of those situations. You're not over-functioning. You're under-functioning. And thinking about, okay, in every situation that I face, what's my part? What's God's part? And what's their part? And you make sure you don't try to do God's part. And you make sure you don't try to do their part for them. But you also make sure you do your part. This will help you sort out all kinds of situations. So, just let me encourage you. I want you to remember this tripod when you try to change somebody. Uh, I'll do a show of hands on this one. How about that? How many of you have ever tried to change somebody? And of course I get it. Because you love them. You want their life to be different. You want them to be different. But every one of us should get crystal clear on the idea that you and I do not have the power to change somebody. You will be set free of a false guilt when you can come to the conclusion that you do not have the power to change somebody. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have any power at all. You should absolutely pay attention to what power you have. What power do you have in somebody else's life? You have the power to create the right environment. To create an environment that would help change flourish, even though you can't change them. And definitely to create an environment that doesn't undermine change in somebody's life. You want to see somebody change? You want your husband or your wife to change? You want your son or your daughter to change? It'd be a healthy thing to step back and say, I don't change people's lives. Someone does. Someone does. God does. So if God changes people's lives, and you want someone's life to change, and you can't change someone's life, what would you do in that situation? I would suggest to you that the very first thing you would do is get down on your knees. Seriously. Get down on your knees and ask God to do a work only he can do. To remember that God is God and you are not. And plead with him to do what only he can do. If you look over the course of the scriptures, you'll see that God will intervene in situations. He will influence situations. He will create circumstances around situations. He will turn hearts. And yet, 
generally, he does not force his way in. There's still a God part and a their part. And if on their part they decide I'm close to what God would do and I'm going to do my own thing and I have my own will, God is a gentleman. Because there's always my part, God's part, and their part. Maybe the quiet confession that can happen in this room right now is to say to God, I've been trying to change them, but I can't, and you can. See, when Jesus was speaking, Matthew recorded this. This is so powerful. He said, Jesus looked at them and he said, with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He is God, and I am not. It'll be healthy to remember this tripod when you feel guilty. When you feel guilty about not helping someone out, you should pause. And I want to suggest to you that when you feel guilty, it's the perfect chance to reflect on this and say, okay, I'm feeling guilty. What's my part? And maybe... You're feeling guilty because you should feel guilty. Maybe you're feeling guilty, and that's actually a prompting from God to say, hey, you're a follower of Jesus. God would say to you, I'm counting on you to help carry one another's loads to engage the broken world that's around you. It is not cool that while people who are overwhelmed and have no hope of figuring out things themselves are left over there, and you just... Decide your life is about you over here. When you feel guilty, you should pause and say, am I just protecting myself too much? But you should also pause and say, maybe I'm feeling guilty. Wrongly. Maybe when the guilty feeling I get and I want to get rid of it causes me to jump into a situation and rescue someone from the consequences of their own decisions. What I did out of love actually is undermining their growth. Because they will not grow if someone else carries their backpack. And so whenever you feel a prompting of guilty, you could come back to this and say, what is my part? What is God's part? What is their part? The scriptures will reinforce this. You'll, some of this, this verse is going to be a gift to you. He says, for even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. If they won't do their part, I'm not going to rescue them and give them the reward for something they should have done on their own. That move is one of the most difficult and most consequential you can make when you love someone. Some of you need to study this way more than I have time to describe, so I'm just going to give you a resource real quick. There's a book called Boundaries. I recommend it all the time. It lives in this principle of helping people when they have a boulder and not over-functioning when they just have their own backpack and they should be carrying it on their own. Last situation, you should remember this tripod. When in your life you omit God, you leave God out of the equation. And I want to ask you to wade into this a little bit tonight. 
I want you to think about your day today. You started at the beginning of today. We're now almost at the end of the day. And what parts of your day today did you need God for? If you began your day with a plan, and you thought, this is what I have to do today, when you made your plan, did you include anything in the plan that you thought, I'm not going to be able to do that on my own, but thankfully, God is with me, so I am going to live by faith and tackle it? Or did you just live the calculated human life that says, I do what I think I can do, I know what I'm good at, I'll do that, I, no, I'm not going yeah. Did you actually omit God? See, this is actually Jesus' critique. He's, he's talking about worry, and he says, you know, the pagans, pagans, not pejorative, just a description. These are people who don't believe in God. He says, the pagans run after all these things. He says, there's a way to live if you don't believe in God. You think it's all up to you. That's exactly how pagans live. But my fear is that Though some of us have faith, we're practical atheists. And that we essentially omit God from everyday life. He says, your heavenly Father knows. He knows. And it would be worth stepping back just for a minute to remember how small I am and how big God is. Have you ever tried to stop and think, when it comes to God, how much do I know about Him? How much power does He have? How interactive does He want to be with my life? And then just sit for a minute because the conclusions you'll come to is that you have probably a small view of God. How much do you know about God? Well, probably like 0.00000001% of God. He's way bigger than you can imagine. And that's available to you in your life. How much power does God have? Well, if you live your life by your power, you live a small life. And if you live your life by God's power, you live an entirely different life. You'll step into situations that are awkward. You'll step into situations that seem impossible because with man, things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And I want to invite you tonight to calibrate your life knowing the work that God could do in you and through you. I'm going to pray for that right now. God, help us not to overfunction, not to underfunction. Help us not to be blame casters who don't take responsibility. And help us not to be people who take all the responsibility. And think it's up to us. In our relationships with others and in our walk with you. Remind us, God, of who you are and who we're not. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I really hope that was helpful for integrating faith with life. Listen, if you're in Northwest Indiana, I'd love to have you join us in person. Head over to suncrest.org and plan your visit.